ignition sequence start. Three, two, one. Lock and load. It's time for the gun rack with your hosts, Joey and Drew. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the gun racks, the Norn Desert Institute School of Firearms Technology's official podcast. I am Drew Poplin here. So I know we've done a lot of interview episodes lately. And I wanted to do something to kind of mix it up. Joey's going to be back soon. Until he gets back with us, uh, I wanted to do a short little episode today. We haven't done a military history episode in a while. And as you guys know, that's something me and Joey love to talk about. So today, I'm going to give you the history of the first recipients of the Congressional Medal of Honor. And this is based off an article I wrote back in March, uh, in late March of this year, I believe. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. I'm going to be taking from the article. If you want to read it for yourself, because my presentation's sloppy, make sure you go check out our website. Uh, it should be there underneath the news tab. If you go there and click on military and history, it will be the fourth article currently up there. All right. So again, going to try and knock this out quick. Don't want to hold you guys up too much. And uh, I have my wife here to make sure that I'm not ranting too much. So this may be a story that a lot of you are familiar with, also known as the Great Locomotive Chase. I think Disney did a movie based off of back in like 1960 or like the 70s or something like that. So it's an older film. But um, you know, this takes place during the Civil War. And when you're talking about Civil War history, a lot of attention gets placed on the eastern front a lot of the battles that happen more so in the eastern states you know sort of right along the coast like you hear all about the battles in virginia obviously gettysburg you know being in pennsylvania and you know stuff like that it, it makes sense that a lot of attention went there because both the union and the confederacy had their capitals they resided within two hours of each other so you have washington dc and then richmond virginia respectively so it makes sense that a large importance was placed on the Eastern Front. However, what was happening in the Western area, the battles that were happening in the West were just as vital. See, when the war kind of kicked off the Confederacy, they knew that they needed to try to be decisive early on and get a lot of early victories. Well, because the Union, they had the advantage when it came to industry and manpower. So the goal was uh, from the rebels to hey, we got to try to win this quick. You know, we can't stretch this war out too long. Otherwise, we don't really stand much of a chance. And so by spreading the war out, the Confederacy would have a hard time defending all that territory. Their numbers would be stretched thin, their resources and supplies, everything like that. By stretching it out, you know, makes for a weaker army when you go into battle. So towards the end of the war, the Western theater would see major victories, including at Vicksburg, Chattanooga, and Atlanta. Let's rewind back to the start of the war, okay? So towards the start, in the Western theater, the Union was suffering from a lack of clear command. And honestly, throughout a lot of the early parts of the war, <laughs> uh, they went through top generals just boom, boom, willy-nilly because they weren't really getting the job done. But particularly in the Western theater, the departments in Kansas, Missouri, and Ohio, they couldn't agree on a plan of attack for you know how they were going to attack the Western Territory. And really, at the time, the only general who seemed to get really much of anything done at all was a brigadier general by the name of Ulysses S. Grant. So in February of 1862, Grant would lead his army to victories at Fort Henry and Fort Donelson. That's like right on the Kentucky-Tennessee border. And by having these victories, it essentially left Tennessee open to be invaded from the north. So soon after that, Nashville was captured by Brigadier General Don Carlos Buell, who was the head of the Department of Ohio's army. If you look on a map, you'll see Fort Donaldson, Fort Henry sort of up there 
definitely northeastern part of the state. And Nashville, real quick, I'm going to check on this. Yeah, so according to Google Maps, it's less than a two-hour drive from where Fort Donaldson was to where Nashville was and is today. But, you know, that's about a 26-hour walk. But still, not much time at all. They were... So it didn't take them too long after to take over Nashville. And again, that was captured by Brigadier General Don Carlos Buell, and he was the head of the Department of Ohio's Army. So shortly after that, Buell's army was merged into the new Department of Mississippi because they were you know, really focusing on that Gulf of Mexico area right there where the Mississippi River is. If they could take control of the Mississippi River, then that would be huge in terms of logistics and being able to get supplies and then also cutting off the Confederacy's ability to do the same. So Beale's army was merged with the new Department of Mississippi. And so Beale was ordered to go southwest and join up with uh, Ulysses S. Grant's army. Uh, so they didn't just want to leave Nashville completely abandoned. So what was left in Nashville was a 7,000-man garrison that formed with another major general, Major General Ormsby Mitchell's 10,000-man division. So 17,000 men left station in Nashville. But before Buell left to go to Mississippi, he was approached by some dude named James J. Andrews. Now, Andrews was a civilian spy and a scout for the Union, and Andrews had this like wild idea. He basically proposed to him that he would allow him and eight men to go steal a train and just wreak havoc in Georgia, particularly northern Georgia. And Buell was like, you know, I'm not going to – yeah, why not? It's nine dudes. It's not really going to be super significant. But if they're able to – you know, if it's somehow able to work, why not? So Buell signed off on the plan. So Andrews and those guys, they get into Georgia, specifically in Marietta, Georgia. And once they got there, they realized, okay, we need to cancel right now. Let's regroup. Andrews, though, still wanted to eventually follow through with this idea. He was convinced, okay, this is going to work, and I need to do something. Let's do this, but not right now. The problem for Andrews was I need a little bit more men. That would be helpful especially because the original group that went with him, they decided, hey, you know, we don't really like being undercover behind enemy lines. It's a bit nerve-wracking. Uh, so they left. But as it turned out, Andrews would get his opportunity to try again. So back in Nashville, Major General Mitchell was seeking a way to capture the city of Chattanooga in Tennessee. If you're not familiar with the geography of Tennessee, Chattanooga is basically in south central Tennessee. It's right there near Georgia, Alabama. And the way that Chattanooga, the geography of it works, is there's a bunch of rivers kind of flowing into it, surrounded by mountains, and it represented an important area of control for the Confederates. It was also a important railroad junction. So you have the railroads and the rivers, and you know, kind of converging on Chattanooga, and so you know, that was major for the Confederacy. So capturing it obviously would be incredible for the Union. However, because of Chattanooga's ge geographical factors, and then also because it was a railroad junction and it's relatively close to Atlanta, which you know obviously was a big Confederate stronghold. Um. Because of the geographical factors and the South's ability to send reinforcements, why it would have been nice to get is also going to be very, very difficult because Confederacy would just be able to resupply troops and ammunition pretty quickly. So it seemed like, okay, this is going to be a tough task. However, if they could disrupt the railroads, the Atlantic and Western railroads that led into Chattanooga, maybe they would have a shot of taking the city. And this is exactly what Andrews would go on to propose to Major General Mitchell. So Andrews would gather a larger group of men this time, increasing his raiders from 8 to 22 men, including another civilian named William Hunter Campbell. 
that's a good author name or like, yeah, that's a good artistic name. Will your Hunter Campbell. So uh, the plan this time involved stealing a train near Big Shanty, which was in Georgia as just north of Atlanta and taking the train from Big Shanty north towards Chattanooga and basically along the way, causing as much mayhem and destruction to the railroad's infrastructure as they possibly could. And by doing that, that allow General Mitchell to come down and not have to worry as much about reinforcements from the South. The reason they decided to do this in Big Shanty was the train station there at Big Shanty did not have a telegram, which would give them more time to be able to you know, do what they wanted to do. So the day was chosen, April 12th. So come April 12th, it already started off great. Uh, two of the 22 men had already missed the rendezvous point. So, you know, okay, maybe we shouldn't do this. No, nah, no, nah, we've, this is the second time. We're not going to wuss out now. We got to do this. So they got, they were waiting in big shanty and a train called the general, oddly enough, pulled in, made it stop. So the rest of the men, they decide, okay, let's go ahead. That looks like a great train to steal. Why not? So they stole the general. It's three passenger cars and a crowbar uh, as they made their way north. They just took it. There was one problem, though. So as they were leaving, they were spotted by the train's conductor. The train's conductor, his name was William A. Fuller. All right, so Fuller and two other men decided to sprint after the train. Eventually, uh, yeah, they just were... <laughs> It's kind of a funny image, just these guys like just booking it, trying to chase down this train. But they eventually found a hand car, like, you know, one of those, uh, you guys know what I'm talking about, four wheels. And they have that like lever in the middle that, you know, goes up and down and it propels the Ford. So they found one of those. And so they decided to continue the chase like that. It sounds ridiculous, I know. But you do have to remember trains in those days were pretty slow. And it wasn't like any of the guys were really trained conductors either, like none of the Raiders. So I think, if I'm not mistaken, the train was only going like 15 miles per hour. So combine the slow speed of the train with the fact that they were making stops to like, and they only had a crowbar at the time. So like, it's going to take them longer to sabotage the different railways and stuff. It, there's a real possibility that this wasn't going to work and they would get caught, but especially because they were spotted. So now the chase was on not long after leaving big shanty Andrews and his crew, they were on the train and they ran across a small locomotive named Yona. It's like Jonah, but with a Y instead of a J. And so they see the small locomotive and Andrews, Starts considering, hey, should we destroy this train? You know, you don't want it to end up, you don't want someone be, being able to hop onto the Yona and chasing you. But because they are already moving kind of slow, and it was going to take, you know, it took them a lot of time to do some of the destructive things they were doing. He deemed it was going to be counterintuitive, which would prove to be a mistake, unfortunately, as Yona would soon be commandeered by... William A. Fuller and those two guys. So they got a nice little upgrade from <laughs> running to a hand car to a locomotive. So they they were cooking. But nevertheless, the Raiders, they kept going north on the way to Chattanooga, encountering a bunch of different obstacles and holdups along the way. But then something bad for Andrews happened. The sky started to open up. It started raining. And you may be wondering, Okay, well, what's the big deal? I see trains. It's not like a little rain's going to stop a train from going. Well, you have to think they were using wood to throw into the engine to you know propel the train. So the rain was soaking the stockpiles of wood they had. So soaked wood me meant less fuel for them. And then you combine that with the fact that that area that they were you know taking the train up, a lot of hills, and it's you know constantly going up. So, you know, fuel was a precious commodity, and it was being ruined. So this was not going well. In addition to that, it also became apparent that the process of actually destroying the track behind them 
stop the pursuers and to do what you know, they were supposed to do. It was taking too long. So in the meantime, Fuller, the conductor of the big general, that's now the conductor of Yona, he had managed to gather 11 Confederate soldiers with him, and they were catching up to Andrews. Finally, they got about 18 miles from Chattanooga, and the general ran out of fuel. They didn't really have any other options other than to run. So as Mitten ran off, they abandoned the train, and that's how the chase ended. Or at least this chase, because now they were on the run. And unfortunately, Andrews and his raiders were all captured within two weeks of the incident. And their bold plan didn't pay off at all. Meanwhile, Major General Mitchell, that was up in Nashville, he was able to capture Huntsville, Tennessee, which is still a 42-hour walk to Chattanooga. So they weren't able to attack Chattanooga at this time. For all intents and purposes, the plan failed. Furthermore, upon capture, eight of the 22 raiders were found guilty of, quote, acts of unlawful belligerency, unquote, and they were pro promptly executed, including Andrews himself. But when the word of the daring plan had reached up north, they were hailed as heroes, especially because, like, you know, two of those guys, they they had no real skin in the game. They weren't soldiers. They were civilians. And just because the plan failed didn't mean that they didn't want to celebrate the heroism and the bravery. And for the other 14 men that weren't promptly executed, uh, they either escaped to safety or they were released in a prisoner exchange that occurred on March 17th, 1863. A few days later, after they were released, they had their story corroborated. Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton would present six of the Raiders with the recently approved Medal of Honor. Among them were Private Jacob Parrott, who was the very first recipient, Sergeant Elihu H. Mason, Corporal William Pittenger, Corporal William H. H. Reddick, Private William Bensinger, and Private Robert Buffum. And eventually 19 of the 22 Raiders would be presented with the Medal of Honor, either in person or post uh, posthumously. I think that's the word, posthumously. But neither Andrews nor the other civilian, William Hunter Campbell, neither of them were eligible to receive the commendation since they were civilians. So that, you know, that's a bit of a bummer, like, especially because, you know, he thought of the plan. But yeah, I get it. Like, it's a award for military personnel. But of those recipients that did receive the award, their citations read, quote, one of 19 of 24 men, uh, which is a heck of a sentence to try to say, one of 19 of 24 men, including two civilians, who, by direction of General Ormsby M. Mitchell, penetrated nearly 200 miles south to enemy territory and captured a rail train railroad train at Big Shanty, Georgia, an attempt to destroy the bridges and track between Chattanooga and Atlanta, unquote. So today there's multiple markers dedicated to Andrews Raiders. They're all throughout the area that the, that the chase took place at. There's actually, uh, if you go to the Chattanooga National Cemetery, a monument was erected in dedication to the Raiders and has a little locomotive on top of it. And I guess when you think of the legacy of it, it's easy to say, oh, well, this didn't matter. And, you know, for me, you guys know this. I tend to, you know, butterfly effect everything, you know, every small victory. It's like, well, if this didn't happen, then that would never happen. And then, you know, the Union would have lost the Civil War. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to do that this time around. It did prove to be pretty much ineffectual. But it was a really nice morale boost for people that heard the story back in the northern states. And when you think of it, one daring raid that was a complete long shot at best started a tradition that is carried into the present day and surely will continue into the future. It's a tradition of heroism and valor that would come to represent one of the highest achievements one can receive in defense of their country. And of course, I'm talking about the Medal of Honor. And that's that. And that's the story of the first recipients 
of the Medal of Honor. Uh, hopefully that did not take too long. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned something. And this was a bit more of a relaxed episode. Yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed. Excited to come back with you guys with some more gun rack content next week. Until then, that has been the gun rack. Have fun, stay safe, and we will see you at the range. Sonoran Desert Institute is an online school accredited by the DEAC. It is headquartered at 1555 West University Drive in Tempe, Arizona. For more information about how you can craft your firearms future, visit sdi.edu.